All right, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for day two of the FC Build Conference. We're excited to have you all here. Um, we've got an awesome conversation for you uh, on uh, diversity. And uh, before we dig in on this, I just wanted to spend a moment to tell you about the FC Build nonprofit partner, uh, which will be, will be receiving all of the proceeds for those of you who opened your wallets. Thank you all uh, over uh, to, 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 to spend on the conference over the last couple of days. Um, that partner is uh, Street Code Academy. It's an East Palo Alto based nonprofit with a mission to empower communities of color with skills, mindsets, and networks to use technology and innovation to enter the innovation economy. Street Code was founded in 2014 by Tunde and Tam Shabomahan, two dear friends of foundation who uh, observed that some of Silicon Valley's most celebrated techies were completely disconnected from the communities of color, in many cases, just down the street from them. You had these beautiful Frank Geary designed headquarters next door and Google 767s flying just a thousand feet over kids in East Menlo Park and East Palo Alto who had little or no access to the technology that these companies had so successfully brought into the world. So there were no laptops, no broadband and no tech education. Now this made no sense to Tunde and Tam. So they set out to solve this problem and what started out as a grassroots movement to teach 20 kids how to code has now served over 4,500 students in the heart of Silicon Valley's lowest income communities, offering free tech classes to coding, entrepreneurship, and design. Now, as you might expect, uh, these communities have been particularly hard hit through COVID times, so we're especially honored to support their initiatives and efforts to help young, diverse uh, minds access technology and entrepreneurial opportunities and build a mu mutually beneficial bridge between Silicon Valley's innovation economy and the underserved communities right next door. Thank you, Street Coat. Now, I'd like to welcome our speakers, uh, Sukinder Singh Cassidy and Ralph Clark, and thank them for joining us this morning. Um, we know you both have a lot going on, uh, and we're grateful for your willingness to share your thoughts and insights. Now, by way of background, Sukinder is founder and chairman of the Board List, um, which start, she started in 2015 to help exceptional women leaders join private company boards. Sukinder has also been a top executive and operator at several notable companies, including StubHub, Google, Yodley, and Amazon. And she served on the board of uh, directors of Ericsson, TripAdvisor, Urban Outfitters, and Upstart. And I'm probably forgetting one or two. Ralph is a CEO of ShotSpotter, which pioneered the use of highly sophisticated acoustic surveillance technology to detect, locate, and alert first responders to outdoor activity, uh, uh, gunshot activity. Now, prior to that, uh, Ralph was the CEO of Guardian Edge, uh, which was acquired by Symantec, and earlier in his career, Ralph worked for IBM, Goldman Sachs, and Merrill. So uh, two heavy hitters with us today. So starting with Sikinder, can I ask uh, each of you to share more about each of your organizations? What, what does the board list do exactly? Uh, well, the board list is a talent marketplace uh, to find and nominate diverse leadership for board opportunities and at some point we'll expand that to executive opportunities as well. So it's really think of it as people often say, is the board, link, board list like LinkedIn for uh, directors? It is, but it really has a focus on finding diverse candidates, which really include women and people of color and connecting them with board opportunity and nominating great people to their first opportunities. Very cool. So you've been very busy as of late, I'm sure. But you've been working on this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <the board. laughs> yes, we've been at it for five years, but uh, 4X, volume increase in the board list this year in terms of companies searching wow. for diverse board talent. That's great. Great. And Ralph, tell us a little bit more about ShotSpotter. You joined, I think, what, 10 years ago now? Yep, 10 years. And first of all, thank you very much for having me uh, participate in this conversation. Um, uh, ShotSpotter provides acoustic uh, gunshot detection services to uh, police departments uh, globally, although we're heavily focused and invested here in the U.S. where gun violence is a particularly uh, challenging uh, problem. Uh, we basically combine uh, IoT, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and cloud-based software to be able to uh, detect, locate, and alert on instances of uh, gunfire in real time with a high degree of precision. And what makes the service, I mean, sadly so compelling is that uh, gun violence is a lot bigger than most people realize. I think we tend to associate gun violence with homicides, but in fact, gun violence is much broader than homicides. In fact, in many communities uh, where gun violence is ongoing and persistent, I mean, guns are fired uh, literally uh, morning, noon, and night. Sometimes they actually hit and hurt someone or kill someone, sadly. But I think kind of growing up in an environment like that where you're put at risk um, is uh, very challenging. And it's significantly underreported because it's become so normalized. 
in many communities. So 90, 95% of gunfire activity goes unreported in some of our most challenging communities. So that's the thing we're trying to address in getting cops the dots so that they can, if they're not encountering a perpetrator or aiding a victim, uh, they can show up in service in there to um, protect those communities from uh, gun violence. Great. Another important mission. So um, <coughs> last summer, I wrote a column for Forbes um, that was making the case for why diversity is disruptive. Uh, it's not just moral, but it's also good for business because it opens uh, doors to new markets and opens minds to new ideas. Um, that's just my thesis, but um, what's the case that you would each make for why inclusion is important for companies? Um, Sekinder, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. Well, first of all, I think you nailed it, so I'm not gonna belabor the point. I think diverse thought drives uh, more innovative you know, more innovative, I would say, kind of idea generation and decision making. And then, of course, it drives return on capital. So if you look at the most diverse companies, research, again, points to increased company performance. Um, but on top of that, and we often think about this, right, we have many constituents we serve now. We don't just serve shareholders. We serve, you know, customers of different types. We serve our employees, you know, and employees who increasingly demand environments that are reflective of who they are and feel inclusive. So if I think if you want a multiple time return on capital, not just return on invested capital for shareholders, but return on your talent capital and your customer capital, you, you know, you will emulate and create an inclusive environment for all of those constituencies. So yes, it pays off, but more importantly, you're managing a diverse set of stakeholders. Uh, and let's note them, they're all diverse. <laughs> your customer base is diverse, your employee base is diverse, <laughs> your shareholders, hopefully are getting more diverse. Uh, that's another problem we need to solve. Uh, but yep. the reality is that it makes sense for all your constituents. Amen to that. Um, I would imagine too, I mean, we were talking about uh, this a little bit yesterday and one of the COOs mentioned how happy they are about the fact that talent markets, uh, now that they're not constrained to New York, Austin, Silicon Valley, and LA, now they're you know hiring great engineers in Kentucky and uh, Estonia and Everywhere. all over the world, and that diversity I think has been a really healthy change. Um, Ralph, how about you? What what does um what how would you make the case for inclusion at uh, Shotspotter? Yeah, I, I think uh, you guys have made excellent points. I don't know that I can expand on it um, uh, really very much, but um, it, to me it's so obvious that uh, diverse views and opinions are uh, better. Uh, you cover all your bases, and I think. Oftentimes when we have diverse talent um, and really understand the journey by which a lot of that underrepresented diverse talent comes to a company, um, just the skill sets they require to kind of get to that place where they're actually participating uh, in a company is hugely beneficial. Um, you know, they had to overcome many obstacles. Oftentimes uh, they have to have a lot of persistence and grit. Again, they do look at the world um, in a very different way. And I think um, a lot of people show up with a very strong, um, I describe it as an empathy uh, gene, because I think oftentimes being uh, underrepresented uh, in, a, in a minority um, in kind of participating in this um, high tech um, economy, um, you have to read the room because you have to figure out. My mom uh, uh, has a great saying, you know, you, you get in where you fit in. Um, and uh, so trying to figure out how to fit in and, and understand how to read a room, those are incredibly uh, important skills. And uh, I think companies can benefit from leveraging them. Well, that's great points. So um, the risk of being mildly provocative. So you know, I think about the extraordinary success that each of you has achieved, CEO of a public company, uh, board member of several other public companies and executives, great roles at companies like Google and Goldman and Amazon and IBM. And to those who might say, well, hey, there's nothing holding either of you back. Um, is there an experience uh, around discrimination uh, that stands out to you that you've experienced or witnessed firsthand that would help our audience kind of get their heads around the size of the problem that we're really facing here? Either of you. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go first. And, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I'll go first. I'm going to share two or three just as examples. And by the way, I, I'm the first to say, I believe I have witnessed more than I've experienced, though I feel like what I've experienced. So if I had to do the balance sheet of my time in Silicon Valley, I would say I mostly fit. I mean, I found my own tribe and culture and a place I could thrive. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been here for 25 years. Let's acknowledge mm -hmm. that, right? Yep. Converse is, you know, I've witnessed and been privy to um, acts of discrimination that are far worse on others than they are on me. But I'll just, you know, let me just kind of start. Number one. Uh, I look pretty similar to all of you. My father wore a turban. My entire family wears turbans. I mean, 
I was from a visibly different minority in a small town in Canada. And I grew up often hearing towelhead, packy, like the list goes on, like all of these just racial slurs against my <clears throat> father, who's like the, who's my hero. So although I never experienced it, I mean, I'd get on a school bus and somebody would be like every once in a while, they would, they would utter those same slurs, right? So I feel like I witnessed it and I was so disgusted, <laughs> but because I by and large speak the same, have no accent, look the same, I feel like I escaped a lot of what I saw my family undertake, but, you know, obviously attuned to it. Um, and then as a woman and a racial minority in the Valley, like as I said, mostly guys, I have found my tribe, but I would identify two points um, that I feel like I witnessed firsthand. One, I was on a board early in my career in the Valley. I won't say which board, which VC, which group of people, but let me just say that I was in a boardroom where I was one of several Indians, right, who were executives in the Valley, and a uh, white male board member at one point when uh, a more junior employee came in to present a product, a product roadmap to the board, uh, left. And uh, one male white VC remarked, uh, fucking Indians can't speak any English. At which point I thought, yeah. oh, my God, you understand you are in a room full <laughs> of Indian tech folks. And of course, like I was, you know, I was young. I didn't say anything. It stuck with me. I mean, I remember all of us who were Indian leaving later and being like, did he really just say that? Wow. You know, and complain about this poor young product manager's ability to speak English when he was quite likely quite nervous presenting to a board. Uh, and then as a, <coughs> as a woman in tech, I have mostly thrived. Uh, but again, you know, I think I was on my first job in the Valley. I was told on my second day that I scared the secretary. Uh, I quit that job six wow. months later because I really was like, uh, I, I'm not sure what I've done to scare the secretaries, but if you're reading my intensity as a negative, to your point, Ralph, and I think your mom's phrase is great, I mostly have gone where I fit. Uh, mm. And when I found I don't fit and there are these stereotypes about what I should be, I bounced. Luckily, mm -hmm. I haven't had to do that many times in my career, twice in a 25-year career, but I've done it uh, because I didn't feel like I was in a power dynamic where I would ever succeed. So, um, and I've witnessed much worse. So to be clear, I am not here to claim that the aggressions I've seen or witnessed are the worst, but I am here to tell you about how frequently they happen. And that's, right. you know, that's disturbing. Hmm. Yep, a lot of work to do. Ralph, what are your thoughts on Yeah, that? so I think um, I'm, I'm really interested in the uh, cumulative uh, microaggressions that happen on a daily basis. So, I mean, there are blatant um, experiences that I've uh, witnessed and been a part of, um, but I mean, and those are damaging and, um, and the like, but I think what's a lot more damaging to folks and holding folks back a lot more are the series of just super tiny microaggressions that add up every single day, every week of the month, every month of the year, et cetera. Um, and so examples of that are, um, um, so I was fortunate enough to uh, be the CEO that took uh, ShotSpotter public. So as an African-American male uh, CEO taking a technology company public, that hasn't happened, sadly, uh, very frequently. And so it was a bit of a unicorn situation. Um, uh, my CFO, who's a really good friend, we're business school classmates uh, together, and I uh, recruited him to uh, join the company as a part of the IPO process, which I had experienced uh, frequently as a banker when I was at Goldman and uh, Merrill Lynch. It didn't prepare me for the number of times, the number of times that we would both walk into the room. My name is Ralph, his name is Alan, and they would reach out, shake their hand, uh, or give, um, be ready to shake Alan's hand and say, hi, Ralph, very nice. <laughs> Very nice to meet you. <laughs> and, uh, I'm the CEO. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm the, uh, I'm the CEO. I mean, and so, you know, you 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 learn just to just move beyond that, because I think one thing um, that a skill that you have to develop is just persistence and just not letting things get in your way or take you off track when you have a, a definitive goal uh, that you after. So you catalog it and you move on. But I think cumulatively, I think when you have to catalog those experiences, you, you it does take a toll, I would say. And I think, um, and so Kendra, you're super brave. I mean, to hear your philosophy around like, hey, where you don't fit in, you just don't, you know, you retract. I think many of us, 
we diminish ourselves in order to fit in a little bit. And mm. I think um, I think a uh, situation we all witness, if you watch the vice presidential debates, and this is not meant to be political at all, but I think anyone paying attention, you could see how Kamala Harris almost had to shrink herself in a way and be so much more deferential to her opponent in that debate. And that's that happens on a daily basis. And I think when we get to the place in the world where people can show up and be their full selves and not have to shrink themselves or figure out how to um, you know, fit in in order to get in, I think we'll have made some accomplishments. Uh, I think we'll really have been accomplished. And I'm, I have four kids, uh, three, three daughters, our oldest, and I, I want her to be so bold and aggressive and ambitious and just not take no for answer. I mean, and that's, I mean, I think she's gonna live in that world, I hope, so professionally. So that's well, uh, so one great thing to you hear said that I think uh, I just uh, sorry, I was just going to echo yeah. one thing, Ralph, that you said that I think is important. And I've always made this distinction because obviously there's the real world, you know, that we live in today and the world in which we all aspire. I think it is important to know that um, the place is to your point. Like, although I say I've quit twice, the reality is throughout my career, I've also adjusted many times like you have. Right. Mm -hmm. um, not with the same frequency. I've certainly had the occasion where somebody thought the man in the room was, you know, was the CEO, not me, <laughs> you know, or other or other like instances. But I do think to your point, what has given me hope and what I've always thought is we don't all need to be perfect. It's hard. Right. It's hard. We all have some biases of our own. I've mostly looked for where there is a values fit, diverse opinion and values fit. And when there is a values mm -hmm. fit, I largely feel like, okay, I can adjust my behavior because at the underlying core, I have enough in common with this person, you know, and I can find it that I am willing to adjust myself a little bit, right? Because if I, you know, if we are also militant, it's also hard to move forward in any of these environments, as you well know. And so you catalog, you adjust. And mostly, mostly, I still move through the world presuming that most people have good intention and presuming mm -hmm. that most people, right. But on any given day, if I can find values fit, then like, you're right. Microaggressions drain. Uh, and mostly I still move through the world looking for values fit and a reason to believe that most people, you know, in myself included, want to be forgiven for the things we get wrong and want to be able to learn and adjust and keep mm -hmm. going. Cause I know I get a lot wrong too. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's the only way I think you can make it now to that to the promised land, right, and still thrive. That's a good point. Have you, in your time and 25 years here in the Valley, Sikinder, have you seen meaningful progress and specific changes that you that you think are to the good? Uh, well, let's put it this way. I think that there are some that are unintended and some that are more deliberate. Let's speak to the unintended but good. Um, versus when I arrived in the Valley and was a founder at Yodely, which was my first company, the number of female and founders and people of color, you know, uh, who are founding and starting companies and building unicorns has multiplied. Now, people always point to the fact that on a percentage basis, it's not fast enough. I totally agree. But they are visible examples and multiple examples. And I think that people need to, you know, to some degree, like one unicorn can pull a thousand more boats, right, of people who think it's possible. Mm -hmm. So I would say, and I don't think that's been deliberate. I think that's been on the backs of people who've had the courage, despite an environment that hasn't really changed, to build those companies. So I would say that's unintended, but powerful, <laughs> you know, and then yep. more deliberately, let's all call a spade a spade. As, you know, in the last 10 years, when people started talking about diversity, reporting diversity numbers, you have cultural crises like Black Lives Matter, cultural crises like Me Too, you know, everybody gets religion. And by the way, that's okay too. I'll take that kind of progress that is, and then you find companies building solutions like the board list what was, when it started it was on its own as somebody trying to build, you know, a company trying to build a technology platform to solve the problem of diversity. Now you look everywhere and you need, I, I see a lot of platforms being built to try and solve bias and discrimination problems. Again, I'll take it. Um, so I do yep. think there's progress. We can all lament the percentages, but uh, make no, make no mistake. There are, there is progress and we are, you know, and you, as you guys know, this is like a tipping point. You just have to keep piling on. There is no such yeah. thing. As I, I do think Cal California is pushing on, uh, you know, two, at least two female directors, uh, diverse directors before a company can go public. I think is, 
You know, that's that's definitely had a meaningful impact. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. There's a question from yeah. from Tunde Shabomahan. I guess uh, he was able to must be listening in. Um, maybe I'll uh, I'll have it uh, for you, uh, Ralph, to take a first set up. But he says we often fight for representation, number of employees or seats on boards. Um, in what ways is this helpful, and in what ways is it not enough? I, I missed the first part of the question. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, Tunde is making the point that um, you know we kind of tend to focus on focus on representation through numbers. Like, is it is it just uh, an issue of numbers of employees or numbers of board members who are diverse? <laughs> um, you know, are we just checking boxes? Is there some to you know kind of tokenism happening here versus like the more meaningful, deep change that I think we're all hoping to see? Yeah, well, if I think I got numbers, your question wrong. Yeah, okay. <laughs> they put it in the yeah, chat. Well, I say, I say, uh, numbers, numbers do matter. Um, I think um, you know that which you don't measure, you don't execute against, and so um, numbers is a form of measurement. Um, and I think measurement's important um, if you're uh, going to be serious and intentional about making uh, making progress. So I'm all in support of numbers, but it, numbers aren't enough. Um, I think um, the the original question about what the economic incentive is for uh, companies to really understand the disruptive power of uh, diversity. I think if, if we can unlock that and really have that um, notion be internalized by folks in power, you don't have to do much else after you've unlocked that understanding because then it's in their interest to make it happen. Um, and until they can get that internalization of that, uh, outside forces kind of pushing things. I guess to some extent it is in their interest uh, when they have certain board mandates and the like that are numer numerically based. It's not internalized, but more external. Those 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 add up and they matter. And so I'm I'm for both. I'm for external factors that are you know driving uh, forms of measurement that people have to execute to and be held accountable to. And then I'm also hopeful that uh, very enlightened people will really understand how obvious it is for uh, them to embrace uh, diversity and look for diverse uh, talent in order to scale and uh, grow their business. I know in our particular case, it's really obvious because we're dealing with a lot of state and local uh, municipalities as a part of our business. Uh, you see a lot of black mayors, you see a lot of um, uh, 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 female chiefs of police that are coming on. And so we can't present ourselves in, in a very um, uh, standard, um, uh, white male way and move in this market uh, um, successfully. Um, so it's in our interest. And I, I think it's it's obvious to us, hopefully it should be obvious to other folks as well, that uh, there's power to uh, bringing in uh, diverse folks. Well, one question related to this, because it's such a profound insight uh, that you hit on and seems so obvious kind of in retrospect. You know, I think back on some of my time at ID where, you know, we, we'd have these uh, amazing brainstorms and encouraging wild ideas is one of the things that was literally written on the wall and pretty diverse teams. And, and that even as I think about, um, you know, how diverse our enterprise team is at foundation, uh, it's literally like sitting around the table of the model UN uh, or UN and um, you know, extraordinary differences. And I think, you know, the first, your kind of first reflex uh, is to sort of, you know, is to maybe resist uh, differentiation. And then I think, you know, stage two is, is accepting, um, and I think this third kind of the most enlightened level is is like embracing it, seeing the power in it, uh, that we get to different ideas. We, you know, there are things that we're discovering and talking about that we just couldn't have without those different different perspectives in the room. One of the things I've noticed is um, it's very hard to measure that. Um, it's very hard to sort of say, hey, this idea wouldn't have happened had that individual not be in the room. Do, do, how do you guys make that case in, in your orgs or, uh, you know, Sekinder, when you're talking about, you know, the power of a diverse board. Um, are, are there case studies or favorite examples that you go back to where you're like, no, no, let me tell you how this happened and it wouldn't have happened otherwise that you think will help kind of pull everyone along towards, I think, this more enlightened state? Uh, well, maybe, I don't give a specific example, but maybe I try and be more pragmatic and I'll just, you know, tell you what I mean. Um, so if I'm a startup founder, and I've been a startup founder three times over, right, I understand why, you know, to slow down and think about building a diverse team feels like, in some ways, the antithesis of speed, right? You're like, wait a second, I can recruit the people I know, I trust them, that matters a lot in a startup, right? I want to be in the box with people who are, you know, who think like me, who can move fast, right? 
more what I encourage than sort of the specific example is I'm like, when you bring a diversity team together, you know, we often think that speed is a trade off. And more what I point to is, you know, it's not it's not the number of diverse people in a room that makes something, you know, uh, more or less speedy decision. It's about the process you use to drive like really diverse discussion, robust debate and then commitment and alignment to an answer and underlying mm -hmm. that's common values. So I don't really honestly talk to people about, well, let me tell you about this time when we bought a diverse person and it changed the case. Mostly what I talk to my teams about, whether they're diverse today or diverse tomorrow, including boards is like, you know what I really want? I want a speedy, fast, um, and really effective decision-making process led with a lot of debate and diversity at the front end. And then I want to drive to a common output and I want to be in a tribe of common values. So I've shifted my talk from like, okay, here's what I think matters. You want to be in a room where like you look around and you, and you are like, yes, we together have a similar sense of what's just and fair and good in the world. You know, we, you know, even if we're incredibly diverse and then honestly, the more diverse the group, you know what I really want? I want a really well orchestrated way to take advantage of all of that debate and discussion and get to an answer quickly. So that's I great. So the diversity, really diversity. So the diversity allows you to flare, get more ideas, but then the alignment allows you yeah. to focus. So it's this flare and focus kind of and, um, and with uh, speed. framing. Like, don't think of diversity as a trade-off for speed. That's the point. Like, don't think of diversity as a trade-off for hmm. speed. Think about how to build like a really awesome framework to get to decisions fast and take advantage of like the best and most debated, you know, thinking at the beginning. That's mostly hmm. what I think on it. Neat. That's cool. <laughs> Awesome. Um, question uh, uh, came over the transom as well. Uh, you referenced, uh, Sikinder, the Me Too movement. Um, and of course, uh, here we, we've had a lot of BLM stuff as well happening. Um, the question is, uh, is Brotopia still around? Um, having read that book, I hope not, but I, but I suspect the answer mm -hmm. is yes. Um, but what's your, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, and I love Emily Chang. She's a, a dear friend and obviously has looked at this. So I think Brotopia is still around. Um, I'll tell you, there's some parts that uh, have gone under, underground, right? Because I think people understand that kind of, we live in an era where these like visibly kind of ridiculous behaviors will undoubtedly get called out on social media or Twitter. So people, so I think, I think what you and I would like, remember those oh shocked movements we had of like several years ago? Yes, is there a lot of fear of exhibiting that uh, on top? And, it, it, you know, yes, because I think so. I think that order of behavior maybe is getting solved. Here's what I think isn't getting solved and why I think Brotopia is still around. And this comes to sort of another opportunity I think the Valley has. Brotopia is also a form of passing around the best opportunities among a homogeneous network. So mm. let's think about things like the cap table, right? It's probably still true that, you know, if Brotopia behavior, you know, order 1.0 is like, you know, going to be shamed out. That what is still true is that networks, you know, pass disproportionate opportunity to their homogeneous and first order networks. So I still think Brotopia defined as, you know, is it kind of easier to pass a favor? Is it easier to hire? Is it easier to give more equity to, you know, is it easier to put on your cap table, you know, your first order? I hate using the word bro, but let's just call it homogeneous network. Uh, yeah, I think that version is still around. And to be honest, that's much harder to solve because it's not shameful behavior. It's like, you know, it's what's easy and feels right. But I would say, and I always talk about this, keeps possibility and opportunity is fairly inequitable at mm -hmm. a much more subversive level. Yeah, yeah. I think your cap table analysis and, I, you know, if you sort of just say budgets and cap tables, do they reflect our values and our goals? Uh, you know, I'm not sure they'd survive first contact <laughs> with reality. I don't think cap tables um, would survive. Cap yeah. tables will not survive it, including the cap table for your employees. Forget about who's funding you, even yeah. you know the distribution of your cap table. People always talk about equal pay. I'm like, let's talk about an equal cap table. Hmm. Yeah. You want to create wealth point. for everyone? You know, Look at your cap table. That is where a lot of the wealth creation happens in the valley. It's not in your hmm. Neat. Wow. Um, so uh, shifting gears a little bit, and we talked a little bit about California's policy on diverse <laughs> boards. Um, Ralph, do you have any specific policy recommendations for how companies, in particular startups, those, I mean, we have a lot of uh, the audience is, you know, literally going from zero to one 
uh, getting this right from the earliest days, you're more likely to have a you know a more diverse uh, org down the line. But what are some of your recommendations, uh, whether they're policies or just guidelines for how companies can do better? Yeah, I'd say um, uh, put yourself in a place of uh, being vulnerable and be uncomfortable reaching out to folks that you t traditionally don't reach out to. Um, uh, I think uh, Sekender made a great point about um, people do what's easy. Um, they tend to associate and double down on their existing uh, networks. And I would ask people to really be aggressive about stepping outside of their comfort zone and uh, developing new networks and new relationships. There's a lot of resources that are out there to um, have people uh, be connected to folks that don't look like them. And they should embrace that as an opportunity to go out and um, make those relationships happen. Interesting. Has the yeah. fact that we've gone virtual over the last nine months made that easier or not really made a difference? Yeah, I mean, um, that's a good question. Um, I would imagine it's made it a lot more challenging uh, to do because it's it's even more difficult, I think, to try to figure out how to network with someone uh, digitally that maybe you haven't networked with before. It's probably a lot easier to meet for a cup of coffee somewhere in uh, Palo Alto than it is to uh, reach out through LinkedIn or something like this, someone you don't know at all and just say, hey, I'm uh, I'm interested in uh, learning a little bit about your uh, journey and um, how we might um, uh, be able to collaborate and work together. So I don't know, I think it would be more challenging. Yeah, I'm sorry, the fact that I think, and Sukinder, you said something similar to this before, there's something about re recent times what I think has um, maybe increased our level of empathy. You know, like if, if uh, one of your kids ran behind you right now, no one would do anything but think that's cool. <laughs> like, But uh, a year ago, you'd be like, oh, you don't have your life together. Why are your kids <laughs> running through the back behind you? And um, and it's gotten a lot more soft and, and I think human around sort of forgiving each other for, you know, like we're, we're in our homes, we're all sort of struggling in different ways, particularly our friends who have kids that are less than six years old. Um, uh, but, uh, but there's also this point that you bring up, Ralph, which is I think a really astute one, which is, we're also kind of not snapping out of our networks. Like we kind of tend to do the things that we're familiar with. And I think um, figuring out how to um, how to do that and the tools, perhaps uh, technology can help in this way. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I, I guess a question, and I, um, I, I would love to take more from the audience to the extent that folks uh, have them, but do either of you see um, a role for technology in lessening discrimination or improving the diversity uh, challenge in front of us? Of course, mm. <laughs> the question is more, <laughs> I mean, it, it's like any big category, right? It, it, there's so many options for technology to solve this problem. I mean, everything from sort of, you know, taking out bias in ATS systems to things like the board list, it's nothing but a talent marketplace, right? For going beyond your first order network when finding a board member. I mean, by still using a trusted and curated vehicle to do it. So um, I think the question is more the opposite. Like, why not use technology to solve this big problem? And for a long time, I felt like the Valley wanted to solve problems like literacy and poverty. And, you know, and I am a big believer in all of those things. But of course, you know, equality and equity is also one of the UN stated goals. So I'm not sure why it's taken us so long to realize <laughs> that, you know, that uh, that's also has, you know, as much, if not, you know, more global impact than many of these sexy proje products that have and projects that have come to the Valley, quite frankly. Uh, so I love and I love all of them, sustainability and others, but this is as big a mission. So for me, it's like, why not? Not why? And I would mostly, if I can jump in, I, I think I would mostly agree with that, but I'll maybe offer a slightly different point of view. I think there's um, certainly opportunities, but I think there's also risk. And I just, I think about some of the things that I see, um, even from a surveillance point of view, like facial recognition is a technology that appears to be not very helpful to uh, at-risk underserved communities, often of color, right? So that's that's an area where technology is not an accelerant right. to um, uh, equity, but almost a friction point uh, to equity. Um, I also just am very concerned about like like consolidating power where um, communities of color aren't able to participate in this consolidation of you know wealth creation, job creation, and career creation. And so there's a, there's a possibility that if we're not paying attention to it, I mean, we could be left behind as a community. So. There are certainly opportunities for technology to play a positive role, 
but I think there's also risk of technology making the gap even bigger. So, yeah, my my next panel, it's it's such a great point. My my next panel actually will um, include a professor from Stanford who uh, got her PhD under uh, Professor Fei Fei Li, who studies bias in machine learning. And of course, um, you know, if if we just took uh, public company boards uh, and you know put them on a uh, image recognition ImageNet software. Uh, or we, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we did this for uh, professors of computer science. We'd end up with more middle-aged white dudes, right? So um, we've got to figure out a way to yeah, sort of, you know, definitely. not have the algorithms uh, reinforce, uh, the, you know, the things that already uh, are out of whack. Um, uh, maybe just um, shifting the gears to boards a little bit, um, Sekinder. Um, again, thinking about the audience with us today, being early stage uh, founders and CEOs. And getting your board right, getting it to be diverse um, is, is super important. Also figuring out how to kind of have the right people around the table for the right scale and the kind of challenges you're facing. You've, you've been in you know, little companies that you founded, uh, big companies uh, as a CEO, um, and you know that dynamic of, uh, you know, of, of what's required of a great board member. Um, how, do you, how do you kind of overlay the, the what I need as a company and a founder at, you know, at that sort of earliest inception phase with where I want to be, that point on the horizon that I want to get to um, as a public company, maybe someday, and what my board looks like and how it will evolve and how diversity and inclusion can kind of play a part of this. What do I have to get right from the earliest days? Well, first of all, and I say this to early stage founders all the time, we tend to think of the board as this like immutable big decision that binds us. And what if I told you instead that versus a public company board on which I've served on many where it really is that form, to get off anything shorter than five years, right? And what if I told you the private company boards are actually a lot of opportunity for A, first and foremost, bringing independent thinking, that is, you know, some value or specialization that you need, right? That by the way, it is itself diverse from the average startup board, which is the founder and the first venture capitalist in, and then the second one. So yep. if you were to expand your definition and say, look, what does it take for my company to be successful? At different stages, it takes different types of thinking specialization, mm -hmm. diversity of different types, right? Because you're going through these different stages of the company. So I often coach founders, I'm like, think of adding board diversity early in your first independent. And if you're afraid, you know, to be honest, I'd be afraid of making a board decision for five years. I wouldn't seek to make one. I would, I would be, I would take advantage of all the flexibility of being an early stage founder. And I might do my first board seat for a year. I might do it for two years. Guess what? That like lowers the risk of adding diversity to your board tremendously, unless you take advantage of mostly the upside. Um, because we mostly need diverse thinking early on in companies. And I don't mm -hmm. think we want just an investor's point of view and the founder's point of view. Both of those people, like, right, we, I think we need the points of view that help create the most value for whatever company stage we're in. Um, and so I actually think there's far more flexibility in early stage board building than most founders uh, credit. And they're far more afraid of the downside. I'd be like, if it was me, I would go rent the mind that is not coming to join my startup right now because it's way too risky. <laughs> and I would go rent that, mind, yeah, yeah. you know, a year at a time or two years at a time because you will be able to attract in some ways better talent to your board until the time that, you know, you have magic product market fit and your numbers are all up and to the right and super fast. And even then you could still, you know, think about board seats in two year terms. So uh, I think. Yep. That's and, and probably also expanding your the risk. And, and probably expanding your advisor network as well. You know, I think there's, you know, folks Absolutely. I think tend to underutilize their advisors. Um, any, any thoughts on this, Rob? I'm going to take one more question from from uh, the audience after this. But any thoughts on kind of getting getting this right from day zero? Yeah. So I think um, although I'm not formally on the NomGov committee of our company, I think I've mm -hmm. operated as the one person uh, NomGov um, per committee uh, building out the board uh, from our initial uh, board members that were institutional investors in the company. And for me, it was just super intentional that we uh, bring uh, diverse talent on board. So uh, we have a seven person board, uh, including myself, uh, three African-Americans are on the board. Uh, one woman, we will quickly um, add another two uh, women to the board um, while not expanding uh, the board. We were fortunate to get uh, Mark Morial uh, on the board. He's a former mayor of uh, New Orleans and now the uh, president and CEO of the Urban League. Uh, Merlene St. Teal was a, a individual that I networked with um, through, you know, African American networks that say, "Hey, looking for uh, someone that is technically uh, competent, um, uh, 
African-American woman would be fantastic. And you start talking to some people and she wasn't a part of my network, but I mean, she was two degrees away from me. We actually had a meeting in uh, Starbucks. Uh, I don't know if we would have been able to pull this off digitally. So this was prior, obviously, to the pandemic. Um, had a great had a great conversation, a couple more conversations. We had a couple other folks in the mix uh, there as well. And I mean, she just turned out to be an amazing uh, fit for the company. Um, in particular for us, uh, particularly for us um, around the InfoSec issue, having been um, a board member on a commercial bank, just brought a lot of really interesting insight into kind of the infosec issues that a lot of board uh, boards are uh, dealing with. And then, you know, we had Bill Bratton uh, join our board. He's not a diverse candidate, but he's obviously very uh, knowledgeable and well-respected in policing. And then uh, we have our kind of institutional investors. And increasingly, I think, Sekunder, you made a great point about how uh, companies evolve and the type of um, experience that you need around the table at stage one isn't like what you need at um, you know stage four or five or whatever. And for us, increasingly having a um, institutional investor venture capital point of view on a public company board is becoming less and less. Great guys, love them. They've really helped get the company to where it is now. But you know the value that they provided in the early days uh, of the company isn't the same. Uh, that um, we really yeah. need to lean on as a public company. So that, we'll see some of those transition off, and then we'll replace them uh, with uh, some female board uh, directors. So very good. Um, I'd love to hit one question that came over a couple minutes ago from Nitya. Um, which is what level of acti activism and advocacy should companies take up to change systemic racism? Related to question, uh, is e ESG a bigger part of the board conversations these days? Maybe the first part of this, you know, it's a, uh, a pretty spicy topic over the summer with Coinbase's uh, position on, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Sekinder and Ralph, kind of where you come out or what, what you've advised uh, of, of your companies and, and, and the entrepreneurs that you advise. Uh, go ahead, Ralph. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, that was really interesting uh, to me. I, I don't know that um, I would go that far personally. And and maybe it's just because, again, um, you know, who I who I am, what I represent. I mean, I, 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 I get I get the point. I don't know using the uh, public company platform is necessarily appropriate in that in that way is, is my is my opinion. I, I would say though, and this is maybe back to the to the question of diversity, how how important it is. So when um, we saw Black Lives Matter and defund the police, it's really interesting um, having uh, when I think about our board and just watching the body language when these topics are coming up because we're in the business of supporting policing. How um, myself, Mark, and Merlene, um, and not to put them on blast, our reaction to Black Lives Matter and defund the police is very different than maybe a white male's version of it, right? To me, it's not as scary. I get it. I understand Black Lives Matter. I understand the point. I don't even understand defund the police didn't get me particularly excited because I knew exactly what the true sentiment of defund the police was. It isn't about technically defunding the police for most people. It's about reprioritizing how policing gets done in at-risk underserved communities. It's pushing back on the notion of being over-policed and underserved. And having that perspective is unique i think because i'm black i just i just i hear that in a different i hear that in a different way so it's interesting kind of talking to folks uh, not only on the board but even in our customer constituency they hear it very differently when they hear defund the police i mean they start their hair starts yeah. setting getting set right. on fire and it's like it's not it's not about that and just the discussions around that now i imagine if that board were uh, homogeneous the set of decisions and the responses to mm -hmm. the whole deep on the police would be very, very, very different. They would right? have missed it all together. Yeah, they would have missed it all. We would have missed it all together. Uh, we would have uh, made different bets, different investments in different positioning and the like. Um, I viewed it very early on. I said, this is going to be wind at our back. This is not wind in our face. This is wind in our back. And it's like, well, wait a minute, translate. I mean, translate that. And so it was interesting um, having that perspective and being able to translate it. And sure enough, I mean, you're able to see, you know, again, the diversity can help you see around corners and um, uh, cover blind spots. And I think we would have been blind to this to this particular issue because, again, you know, fast forward six months from now. We definitely see that defund the police isn't technically defund the police. It's more around reimagining policing 
holding them accountable to serve and protect versus overlord and occupy and the like. So anyway, yeah. that's uh, of, of the of the three word slogans out there that might have been the worst one of 2020. Um, yeah. but, but anyway, Sikinder, what are your thoughts? What do you advise when you're sitting on these boards and people are asking this question of do we get to talk about this as a company? Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, to answer quickly, is ESG a part of every board conversation? The answer is it is. I mean, that I mean, it can't not be if you're if you're a board member. But let me take maybe the first part, and then I know we're about wrapping up. I want to separate out two concepts. Number one, you have a constituent on your in your companies, your employees who want to be active on topics and self-express. You know, that is one form of activism, and I think every CEO hopefully comes to their own. You know view but generally speaking we live in a world where our employees want to bring them full their full selves to work right this is inclusivity at its best and that right. includes expressing the causes they care about there's the company being supportive of that that's one level of what we would call activism but i would just mm -hmm. say it's the new norm mm -hmm. and then there is employees expectations of the value system of the company and its stance on activism you know, and I think that mostly, look, not to get into the coin-based debate in, de in detail, mostly what I believe is employees want to understand what the value system is of the entity, right, and how that correlates or not to, you know, the things they yes. believe. And, and so then they can choose whether to be a part of it or not. CEO. Yeah. Yeah. Or not, yep. right? That's exactly right. So I think that yep. I think the new call on the new, new age CEO is like, hey, what is our value system as a company? What are we going to stand for or not? And then there is the layer of like, look, we live in a world where people want to bring their full self to work and at least be right. free to express and share their ideas on topics they're passionate about in their community with other like-minded individuals at their company. That's part of their yep. community too. Yep, yep. Well, I'm going to let that be our last word. Um, thank you both, uh, Ralph and Skinder, for making time, uh, knowing how busy you are. I know this audience is really appreciated. There's two more questions that we didn't get to, but uh, I guess that's just proof that we're, uh, we're, we're not done yet. Um, but I uh, really appreciate it um, and uh, I'm grateful for time. And again, thanks to our friends over at uh, Street Code Academy for all you guys are doing. So anyway, all right. Thanks everyone. We'll see you at the next Thank panel. You. Great, thanks Steve. Yeah, yeah. nice meeting you, Sikinder.